Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're continuing with part 3 of the third installment of my complete character tier list series, where we are going over every single multi-class combination in Baldur's Gate 3 of the 12 base classes, rating the strengths and weaknesses of those multi-class characters, how you fit them into a party, why you want to fit them into a party, and then placing them in a tier list according to their strength. I'm judging these characters on three different metrics. One is how powerful are they when they reach their optimal form? In other words, how much damage do they do? How much control do they add to your party? How resilient are they? And so on. Another is how versatile are they? So how easy is it to get these characters to that optimal form? In other words, how many different ways can you combine these two classes? How easy are they to fit into a party? Do they have specific item requirements in order to reach their highest possible power level? And so on. And finally, how forgiving are they to actually play um, in the face of play mistakes or... Uh, in the face of odd bugs and so on, will this put you in danger if you end up in a situation that go where the battle is starting to turn against you? Uh, many builds only function perfectly when the situation is entirely under your control, and so how easy it is for this character to get out of bad situations or turn bad situations back in your favor is a really important consideration for honor mode, where you can't just reload a save. We are, of course, judging these characters for honor mode, but they, the tier list will still be totally applicable to lower difficulties, and I'll mention when something changes significantly on a lower difficulty, as it does for some multi-class combinations. In part one of this tier list, I covered every possible multi-class character for, bard, uh, for Barbarian and Bard, and in part two, Druid and Cleric, and so in part three, we are going to begin with the Fighter. As a quick reminder, I am placing each of the 12 classes in turn in the paired class column up here, or row, I guess, um, where, and then placing each subsequent class in the tier list as to where I think that multi-class combination falls. So, for example, if I place fighter in the paired class column and barbarian in the S tier column, then that means I believe that that multi-class combination of fighter and barbarian is an S tier character combination. All right, without any further ado, let's get in and start talking about fighter. Also, for a complete description of every tier, uh, I did that both in part one and in part two, so I won't spend time going over every tier again, but uh, you can of course refer back to the previous videos for the description of those, it's present in the intro. So Fighter has the distinction of being the best two level dip in the entire game, because it gives you access to Action Surge, which is one of the most powerful class abilities in the game, and you get it at level two of Fighter. That means that Fighter combines exceptionally well with only a few levels, with a bunch of other with almost every other possible character. Basically, any character that likes to take turns, Fighter is good with. Um, and it, as it turns out, that's every character in Dungeons & Dragons. So it will not come as a surprise that in the previous tier lists, I have rated so far every combination with Fighter as an S-tier character. Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Druid, all of these combine as S-tier with Fighter. The reason for this is twofold. One, of course, Fighter is an incredible two-level dip, getting you access to Action Surge. Two, it's an incredible one-level dip, getting you access, if you take it as your first level, to Heavy Armor, Shield, and Martial Weapon proficiencies, Constitution Save proficiency, which is really valuable for various casters who want to maintain concentration on their spells, and, of course, also uh, Fighting Style, which is a really nice small boost both to Martial and to caster characters. An additional AC from Defense Fighting Style is incredibly powerful, as well as a little bit of additional resiliency from the extra healing that you get. Fighter is a short rest cooldown dependent class, so it's going to combine especially well with other characters who have resources that come back on a short rest. Um, and Fighter, as you level it up, has numerous breakpoints where you can leave Fighter while still gaining a huge benefit. At Fighter level 5, you get extra attack. At Fighter level 6, you get an additional feat, so you can do a lot of 6 3 3 splits and still hit, still. Uh, with fighter and still max out your attributes by getting two feats. At level 8 you get a, another feat, and at level 11 you get a third attack. All of these are incredibly strong breakpoints to leave fighter, and so there's a ton of different combinations of class levels and 
com uh, classes and level splits that you can do with Fighter and still end up with an incredibly powerful character. So it is, of course, no surprise that Fighter is one of the most versatile and flexible multi-class combinations in the game. I would be uh, very surprised if I end up rating any of these possible combinations below A tier, and as I go through it, it's very possible we'll end up with every single class in S tier for Fighter. So, to kick things off, let's talk about Fighter and Monk. So, this seems like a pretty natural combination, because Monk is a martial character. Fighter combines extremely well with other martial characters in general, because Action Surge allows you to make multiple attacks with your extra attack actions. Um, if you use, on Honor Mode, if you use Haste for an extra action, or an Elixir of Bloodlust for an extra action, you still only get to make one additional attack with... Uh, on, on honor mode, even if you have the extra attack feature, but with action surge, you can still make all of your attacks. So fighter gives action surge and allows you to make your full set of attacks with other martial characters. However, monk benefits less from this than many other characters because monks actually don't care as much about actions as they do about bonus actions, because flurry of blows is as good or better than your main hand attacks in many circumstances. Extra actions, of course, are worth extra chances at stunning strike and and other opportunities but uh, in general to maximize your monk's damage you just want the additional bonus actions so multi-classing monk with thief rogue for an extra bonus action is basically like having action surge every turn flurry of blows is two attacks your main hand attack is two attacks so with thief rogue you get to have the equivalent of the, the same amount of additional damage that you get from action surge but every single turn of combat rather than just on a short rest resource of course the fact that fighter is a short rest class and so is monk means that they have some natural synergy there but the the main thing that this runs into is just the extremely constrained nature of monk builds i've talked about this previously that most monks are locked in at nine three or eight four split with uh, Thief Rogue in order to make use of Tavern Brawler and the bonus action Flurry of Blows, and there's not a lot of room, if you're building Monk for Honor Mode, to deviate that much from that build. However, if you are using Elixirs to uh, reach 20 Strength so that you don't need to put feats into Strength, then a 6 Monk 3 Fighter 3 Rogue build still gets you the bonus action uh, offhand attack, the bonus action, the additional bonus action for the offhand attacks, gets you action surge for some extra burst damage, and you can still hit 20 strength, and you still get one feat from your six monk levels in order to hit Tavern Brawler. You get to hit monk six for the, the good class features that they get at monk six, notably open hand. Uh, additional damage. So there are level splits that you can do where you can work in some levels of fighter and still benefit pretty heavily. It is a very tightly constrained build, but it's going to be the highest damage that you can reach for the most part with your monk builds, and that is certainly not nothing. It's going to look really good in YouTube clips if that's your goal. Um, but of course, you, you do pay the price of having to chug an elixir every day and having an extremely constrained leveling path. The other things that uh, fighter dips give for monks are not as important for monks. Uh, con saves don't really matter to them because they aren't trying to maintain concentration on stuff. Heavy armor proficiencies are and shield proficiencies are not useful for monks, typically, because they're going to want to be unarmored. Um, although the additional healing can be pretty useful because any additional resiliency that monks can get is pretty nice, so just even a few extra hit points and healing from a uh, fighter level is is pretty valuable for a monk build. And of course, it must be said that non-tavern brawler monk builds do technically exist, um, and you can even go for armored monks, in which case pairing them with fighter is actually really good. Uh, just because you lose your unarmored movement and unarmored defense doesn't mean that monks can't wear armor. Um, so if you have good armor proficiencies on a, on a monk build, such as from an initial level of fighter, you can actually build armored monks and they can be pretty resilient. In the other way round, you can take a level of monk on a fighter build, and fighters, as I mentioned, one of their level splits is 11, so one level of monk fits pretty nicely into a fighter build, just to get the bonus action offhand attack, and then twice per short rest flurry of blows. Um, if you are using a sword and board fighter or some other non-two-handed fighter, then adding in a bonus action offhand attack from the monk's uh, uh, 
unarmed attack that they get whenever you make a main hand attack can be extremely powerful. One thing that fighter builds do sometimes struggle with is having damaging uses for their bonus action. Obviously, all martial builds get great default uses for their bonus action. Jumping and shoving are both just really good uses of your bonus action in combat. Um, but adding in a damaging bonus action basically gets you an extra attack every turn, a third attack uh, every turn. If for a dexterity-based fighter build that uses, uh, this also lets you use a non-finesse one-handed weapon with the monk's um, dexterous attacks feature, because it'll count as a monk weapon because you'll be proficient with it. So you can use like a longsword or something with your dexterity and also benefit from an offhand attack. And that's actually a pretty cool use for a monk and fighter uh, dip. Is this like the best thing to do with the one remaining level from your 11 levels of fighter. I don't know. I think there's lots of possibilities there, but I think it's very good. And of course, vice versa, you have an extremely powerful build, elixir reliant, but extremely powerful. Overall, the core strategy of fighter and monk mixes of either being offhand attacks for your fighter build, which is very powerful, or action surge for your monk thief rogue build using a 6-3-3 or 6-4-2 split, both of those are incredibly powerful builds, and mixing fighter and monk enables a host of other more niche builds like armored monks or more even mixes where you can get like a 6-6 six, six split, still hit your tavern brawler feats because, still get three feats because fighter gives you three um three uh, fighter gives you two feats with only six levels of fighter and hit your your monk features as well or an 8-4 split there's a lot of different splits that work just fine for this build even out even if some of them constrain you out of multi-classing monk and rogue but uh even though that is typically better you can mix all three together and the existence of all of the niche builds and two just extremely powerful top tier builds uh with this split means that i'm going to rate it s tier Fighter and Paladin. So once again, these two classes at first glance seem like they're going to synergize extremely well together. Uh, Paladin is a martial class, and Fighter gives you extra attacks with Action Surge, and Paladin is a burst damage focused class whose usual play pattern is to try to do as much damage as possible in the opening round of combat, and then you go have a nap because you've used all your resources, and you're just trying to kill things as quickly as possible with high level smites and as many attacks as possible. Action Surge obviously plays extremely well into that strategy because it gives you the ability to add just more attacks, even more smites if you have the spell slots for them, into your opening rounds of combat, and that's very good. The downside of these two characters is that they get a lot of stuff that's kind of redundant. Uh, obviously, all the weapon and armor proficiencies are shared. Both classes have full proficiencies in everything, so you're not gaining any additional proficiencies by adding in these classes. And the saving throw mixes are, um, like, both of them have good saving throws. Adding con saves to your paladin is nice, because especially for a vengeance paladin that might want to be concentrating on haste, being able to maintain concentration on haste more easily is of course very important. Adding wisdom saves to a fighter is probably a slight improvement. Uh, if you take an initial paladin level, you would probably slightly rather have wisdom proficiency than con proficiency for a fighter, but both of them are getting good saves, so it's not something that you are going to uh, really benefit hugely from by adding in the, the additional saving throws. A second fighting style for either type of character is very good, um, because two fighting styles lets you get both the, for example, great weapon fighter and defense fighting style and get some of the better fighting styles in the game, or defense and protection, both of which are pretty useful for various builds. Although, since Paladin doesn't get their fighting style till level 2, that would cost you hitting Fighter 11 if you wanted to mix it that way. The main downside, of course, of these two characters is that Fighter doesn't give you spells. Uh, Eldritch Knight gets a spell level every third level, and otherwise Fighter gets no spell progression at all. So Paladin's main feature of Smites is held back by having fighter levels. Paladin, the way that Paladin multi-classes is that you get a caster level every even level of Paladin. So you need to hit, um, in order to hit fourth level spells, you need to hit, for example, eight levels of Paladin plus three levels of another full, full caster if you want to get fourth level spell slots to maximize your smite damage. If you have two levels of fighter in the build in order to get action surge, you cannot hit that uh, 
that full caster level. Even adding in a third level and taking Eldritch Knight for an additional caster level doesn't get you the highest level spell slots on your Paladin build, so you're giving up some damage. You're also not hitting your Paladin or Fighter's level 11 features, both of which add a bunch of extra uh, damage to each character, if you're making use of these, char these classes' signature abilities, both of which come at level 2. So the way that you fit these characters together actually constrains the options significantly. I, I think that uh, fighter builds in general don't benefit very much from having paladin levels. The things that your that paladin adds to fighter, you just get better by having you you get more of just by having more fighter levels. Paladin levels paladin builds can benefit from having fighter because action surge, like I talked about, is extremely valuable for for paladin builds to increase their initial burst. And again, if your goal is to make a YouTube highlight with the highest possible damage per turn, then this fighter, uh, this combo will work extremely well together. But by restrain, restricting how many spell slots you get access to, because you're not able to hit fourth level spells, it reduces your total smite damage, and it is... Um, extremely resource intensive. Adding in a short rest requirement to your long rest requiring paladin means that you need both short rests and long rests. Typically on a character you want to either use short rest or long rest resources. There's um, obviously a lot of nuance to that, but that is in general the way that you want to structure your builds. And this mixes the two, which me makes them a little bit harder to use. It's not that there's no value from Battlemaster levels or uh, Eldritch Knight levels for a Paladin, both of those are obviously incredibly good and you get a lot of damage and you can reach some of the highest possible damage in the game. But in general, if you are trying to give yourself short rest resources on a Paladin, you'd rather just have Warlock spell slots, which can be as much or more damage, reduce your multi-attribute dependency by having seven levels of Warlock. Um, on Tactician or below, get you a third attack, obviously, as well. Um, and... Adding in fighter levels is really good for your burst damage turns, but makes the rest of your turns a little bit worse. Now, the game heavily favors burst damage turns, so that can still be a very powerful and viable trade-off, but I think that the restrictions that this adds to your build means that I'm going to place it in A tier rather than S tier, because even though it reaches massive burst damage, it's going to make your, your Paladin already a rest-hungry class even hungrier for rests, um, and it does prevent you from hitting other really important benchmarks for Paladin if you get enough fighter levels to reach the, the features from fighter that you actually want. Fighter and Ranger. So obviously Fighter and Ranger, again, martial characters benefiting from Action Surge. And in fact, uh, these two characters uh, together, I think, are one of the most common character class pairings for multi-class builds in the entire game. The reason for this is that three levels in Gloomstalker Ranger and three levels in Battlemaster Fighter are is the core component of basically every archery build that you're going to build in Baldur's Gate, uh, with the exception of ones that use Swords Bard, although even then, a Swords Bard 6, 3-3 uh, three, three split with Swords Bard is still really, really good. And of course, you'll take a few more levels in, in on most of those builds, you'll take a few more levels in one or the other of Fighter or Ranger in order to hit extra attack and to make sure that you get uh, enough feats to max out your dexterity. Together, these two classes are what makes archery builds work. Um, they are incredibly powerful together, giving you massive burst damage with your action surge turns, additional damage from Battlemaster maneuvers, all of which work at range, and archery fighting style from, or uh, two fighting styles from the two together. Uh, just an incredibly powerful combination that is the absolutely uh, bedrock requirement for most archery builds in the game. The number of attacks that you get from the, combining these two characters alongside all the utility is enormous, and every single ability that they get synergizes incredibly well together. There's other splits you can do as well. One level of fighter for your Ranger 11 build can get you heavy armor, if that's something that you're interested in, um, to still hit level 11 in Ranger. You can also benefit from like an 8-4 split with fighter to gain access to some of the Ranger utility and Again, additional fighting styles and so on. Those are going to be less common than, say, 
a, a 5-3 or 5-4 or 3-3 three, three split between the two characters, but they will al always be really good. Um, I think that in general you're going to be looking at a combination of Fighter, Ranger, and Rogue, or Fighter, Ranger, and Bard for just about every... Those four classes together in various combinations are every Archer build in the game, and mixing them together makes, the, makes all of them extremely powerful. All of these classes can have great breakpoints at level 3 or level 2, and so they benefit really heavily from being mixed together. Honestly, there's not that much more to say about uh, this character combination. It's just really good. It's the core of about a million of the best builds in Baldur's Gate. Uh, you can build this for melee ranger as well, of course, if that's, uh, you know, me melee builds can work as well, of course, if that's something that you're interested in doing. Gloomstalker for a melee great weapon fighter is really good as well. Just an additional great weapon attack off the start of combat is really powerful. Usually you're going to use these two in combination for archers, but still just generally an incredibly powerful combination of, of classes that synergize extremely well together. S tier, of course. Fighter and Rogue. So in a way, I already just talked about this when talking about Ranger, because the most common way to combine these two characters probably is with the Archer builds that are uh, combined Fighter, Ranger, and Rogue to make basically all the power most powerful Archer builds in Baldur's Gate. Of course, there's a lot of other ways to combine these two characters as well. One level of Fighter gets you a fighting style, which can include two-weapon fighting, which just adds a bunch of damage to any offhand attacking Rogue. Um, rogues use offhand attacks frequently, so that is very powerful just in and of itself. More levels of Fighter are really good for Rogue builds as well, because if you can get uh, extra attack on your Rogue, it solves a lot of the problems that this this class has. So five levels of fighter or six levels of fighter for an additional feat solve a lot of the problems that rogues, uh, that rogue as a base class suffers from. This makes you a pretty resilient character thanks to the defensive abilities that rogue gets and the HP and healing that fighter gets, plus adds action surge and extra attack, so you're doing a lot more damage than a base rogue would be doing if you do a 5-7 or 6-6 six, six split between these two characters. A level of rogue for your fighter or uh, can also give you a lot of extra skills on your fighter. Having your uh, fighter suddenly be capable of actually doing making skill checks. One of the main downsides of the fighter class in general is that they're pretty poor at skills, have bad skill access, um, and really only get access to athletics as a relevant skill and don't get anything that boosts skills, an initial level of rogue can totally solve that problem as well, making your fighter significantly more helpful to your party out of combat as well as in combat. More levels of rogue are probably something to avoid just because level 11 fighter is so powerful, but it's certainly a possibility. You can also do like a 10-2 split with Fighter and Rogue and get the Rogue's third feat at level 10, which is kind of fun as well. Not something that I'd recommend over the 6-6 split, probably. I'd just go for that if you want um, to hit three feats on that, that level split, or the 7-5 split just for two feats and extra attack. But overall, these two characters can combine either just as a two-class combination with one another in a number of different ways and gain massive benefits from all of those uh, possible level splits, or as multi-class combinations with Ranger, with Barbarian, with Swords Bard for various Archer builds, all of which are extremely powerful, various melee builds, all of which are extremely powerful. The bonus action dash and additional bonus action from Thief Rogue can help with... Uh, giving even more mobility to various fighter builds, especially dex-based fighter builds, dexterity-based fighter builds that won't have great jump distance. So all of those possibilities combine in incredibly useful ways. I think there are very few level splits between these two classes that won't work and result in an excellent character, and mixing in additional levels of other classes works extremely well. Again, these are two characters that just get a lot of their power really, really early. Fighter gets a big chunk of its power by budget at level 1 and 2, Rogue gets almost the entirety of its power budget by level 3, and so you can use these as the core of numerous builds to splash in levels of other classes and just get all the best features of both of these classes really early, letting you make uh, a number of... Uh, make any number of builds, all of which work extremely well, S-tier combination. 
Fighter and Sorcerer. So normally, Fighter is an S-tier combination for every caster class because it gives you heavy armor, shield proficiencies, a fighting style, and con save proficiency, as well as with a second level Action Surge, which lets you manipulate the action economy in an incredibly powerful way, which is really good for casters who are doing really powerful things with all of their actions. However, Sorcerers already get a lot of those things. They already start with con save proficiency, so they're not benefiting from that, and they already have as a core component of their kit action economy manipulation through twinning and quickening spells. Obviously action surge is still really good for sorcerers, but it's not going to be as much of a qualitative difference or change to your playstyle as it would be for other casters because sorcerers are already able to do a lot of those things. Action surge and then casting multiple sorcerer spells is still really good, of course, but gets pretty resource intensive and it's something that you can already do uh, reasonably effectively just by quickening or twinning spells. Uh, most spells that you're casting. So mostly what you're getting from the one level fighter dip for sorcerer is weapon and armor proficiencies, or uh, armor and shield proficiencies, excuse me, and the fighting style, all of which are very good, but you can get all of those from a cleric dip, uh, and if you take fighter as your first level on a sorcerer, you give up access to a lot of sorcerer's dialogue skills, which is an important component of sorcerer's power level as a class, so it is a real sacrifice to give up those dialogue skills by taking an initial uh, fighter level. If you try to take the fighter level later, you don't get all the proficiencies, you only get medium armor, which is still good, but um, is something that that means that the cleric levels are usually going to be a better dip for proficiencies. One level of cleric is going to be a better dip for proficiencies and gives you a lot more utility than a level of fighter. In reverse, a sorcerer, and a sorcerer level for a fighter is pretty good. Adding shield, out of combat flight from storm sorcerer, uh, various thing. Uh, various level 1 spells, all of which are very powerful, to fighter, an additional caster level for your Eldritch Knight, which is not bad either, are all very viable additions to your fighter, although there are some things that do hold that back. One is that if you take it as your first level in order to get the dialogue skills from Sorcerer, again, you lose heavy armor proficiency, so you're, you're stuck with medium armor, um, because if you take fighter or paladin at after level 1, you only get medium armor proficiency from those classes rather than heavy armor proficiency. Cleric still gives you heavy armor proficiency because it's a subclass feature and not a class feature. Generally, also, by the way, I think that's a dumb mechanic. They, they removed most of the uh, restrictions on multiclassing in Baldur's Gate 3, which I think was good, um, but left that one in as sort of an artifact of more restricted multiclassing and tabletop. If you take fighter or paladin, it should just give you heavy armor proficiency. There's no reason for it not to. Um, but that's a that's a side note. In in the current state of the game, it doesn't, and so you are giving up some stuff if you take sorcerer as your first level of a fighter build. And if you take it as the second level of a fighter build, then you are uh, delaying your access to powerful fighter features in exchange for shield and not getting dialogue skills, and you can get shield from being an Eldritch Knight, so it's not giving you a massive advantage in terms of um, mobility or defensive stats that you wouldn't get from other one level dips for fighter. So I think in general these classes have less utility as one level dips for one another than you would expect, but of course two levels of fighter for, for action surge for a sorcerer is still just incredibly powerful, or three levels because you don't give up a caster level if you take uh, Eldritch Knight on your sorcerer. You can make sure that you have weapon and shield profi or armor and shield proficiencies, gain a lot of additional health and action surge, which allows you to manipulate the action economy even more. I think that this is a relatively constrained build because there's a lot of ways where you're not getting that much from mixing these two classes together, but action surge for a caster is just so good that it's still an A tier uh, class combination. Usually you're going to go with another class for your sorcerer builds, like usually Cleric, as the, the mix with Sorcerer, but this is still just a, a pretty powerful combination. Action Surge, cast two spells, is such a good play pattern that it's worth A tier all by itself. Fighter and Warlock. 
So I've mentioned, of course, many times that Fighter pairs extremely well with caster classes, giving you con save proficiency and armor and weapon proficiencies and action surge, all of which are useful. All those things are true for Fighter and Warlock, but even more so for two reasons. One is that Warlock gets their highest level spells at level 9, so often Warlock builds will want to leave after 9 levels of Warlock, because while you do get more things from going up to level 11, obviously you get the additional spell per short rest, you get the uh, once per day 6 level spells, they are less powerful than what other spellcasters who actually get 6 level spell slots get from maxing out their levels. So Warlock builds will often have a few extra levels that they can dedicate to taking something like 2 levels of Fighter and uh, 1 level of Sorcerer, something along those lines, in order to gain access to Action Surge and a bunch of extra utility. Um, and Action Surge itself, which is already very good for all spellcasters, is even better for Warlocks because in every fight they have two of their highest level spell slots available. That means that in the opening round of combat where another spellcaster might want to conserve resources and will use their would use their action surge action for a lower level spell or even firing off a cantrip and not get that much value from it, Warlock's default action of firing off an Eldritch Blast or their uh, max level spell, something like a leveled up command or a fireball, depending on what type of Warlock you are, means that you are getting even more value from the action surge action than other spellcasters, who are already getting a ton. So altogether, there's a lot of synergy there with just a few levels of fighter for Warlock. Of course, Warlocks will always be concentrating on spells between Darkness, Hunger of Hadar, Haste from a Tome Warlock, and so on, so the con save proficiency is extremely valuable, and Warlock by default benefits pretty heavily from getting heavy armor and shield proficiencies because they will allow you to uh, avoid getting hit more often. Warlock's a fairly squishy class is one of the few downsides of the class in, in general. It's also a short rest cooldown for a short rest reliant class, so it lines up very nicely in your resource consumption. Altogether, the classes just have a ton of synergy and pair extremely well uh, with one another. On Tactician mode or below as well, Blade Warlock's extra attack stacks with other sources of extra attack, so you can do a 5-7 split in either direction to get 3 attacks per round, and that is of course extreme per action, excuse me, because you'll be doing action surge, so it'll be 6 attacks in the opening round of combat, and that is of course extremely powerful. Um, also, just the fact that you can Eldritch Blast every turn of combat means that extra actions are even less likely to be wasted on Warlock builds than on other builds, so the action surge uh, value is even more pronounced. Generally speaking, I think that most Warlock builds, if you don't have a specific uh, hybrid in mind, like Bard or Paladin, will benefit from a couple levels of Fighter. I think that if you are going for a pure Warlock, or uh, a, a Warlock-focused build, a couple levels of Fighter is going to work really well in your Warlock-focused build. In particular, of course, it works very well with Eldritch Blast-focused builds, because you can fire off Hunger of Hadar and then Action Surge and Eldritch Blast, or fire off a Self Haste if you're a Tome Warlock, and then get still get two Eldritch Blast actions in the opening round of combat. Um, but it is just very valuable for all Warlock builds. Fiend Warlock's Command is another great use of an action for a, a, your Action Surge action, and can be combined with Hunger of Hadar in the same turn to keep enemies trapped in the Hunger for even longer. Just an incredible amount of synergy between these two classes, and the builds fit very well together because each of them are very likely to have a few levels to dedicate to the other. Overall, I think that you will less likely splash Warlock levels into a Fighter build, but the existence of the hybrid builds and splashing Fighter levels into a Warlock build means that this is, of course, an S-tier combination. Fighter and Wizard. Yep, I've said it before, Fighter pairs extremely well with casters, and again, no exception. You get con save proficiency, you get armor and shield proficiencies, you get defense fighting style, all the things that Wizards love to have, um, and Wizard usually just wants to hit level 11, so one level of Fighter fits in very well. Two levels of Fighter, or uh, three levels of Fighter, also fit in extremely well. You don't lose a caster level if you take Eldritch Knight, and you get Action Surge, which of course for casters is always very powerful. More even splits are also actually pretty good because Abjuration Wizard exists, and Abjuration Wizard can add a bunch of damage reduction to your fighter, who if they're using like Heavy Armor Master and Heavy Armor Proficiencies, you can have a quite tanky character using a hybrid split with Abjuration Wizard and your fighter levels, and that is also an extremely powerful melee combatant and very safe to play through honor mode thanks to the damage reduction. So also a very good build, check my... Uh, 
a build called, I think, the best Elder Knight in Baldur's Gate 3 for more on that more even level split. And a couple of wizard levels for fighter. Not a huge benefit, but you do get a lot of extra caster levels and can learn a bunch of scrolls if you're doing an Eldritch Knight fighter. Eldritch Knight will have a few caster levels, so a couple levels of wizard can get you some higher level and some higher level spells and some of the really important spells. Usually that's going to be less of a consideration than adding fighter to your wizard builds, but most of the time I think these two classes pair pretty well together as well. Um, fighter is, as always, just really good for casters because so much of the stuff that you get so early, it works extremely well for casters. Yet again, an S tier combination. All right, my friends, this has been Fighter. Uh, I, I think that this is a funny one because I'm tempted to move these two up to S tier just for the jokes, but I do think that Fighter pairs just phenomenally well with every character. One or two levels of Fighter is the natural multi-class option for just about every possible character uh, in the game. If you have a couple extra levels, you should always consider Fighter. It's very similar to Cleric in that way, in that they, so much of the class's abilities are front-loaded that you can benefit extremely strongly from taking Fighter on just about any character. Next up, Monks. So I've gone ahead and placed all of the monk multi-classes from previous videos and from earlier in this video in their respective tiers already. Uh, you can jump back for more detailed information on those in previous videos. If you are jumping back to previous videos, by the way, if you just let it run for a little bit after you've watched the bit that you are interested in, that does help me out a lot because if people watch like two minutes of a video, then YouTube assumes they've gotten bored or bounced off it rather than just they're looking something up in it. Obviously, I don't expect people to like waste their time doing that, but it is helpful if that's something that you're interested in doing. So monk multiclassing is really interesting and somewhat restricted, be not necessarily because so many combos with monk are bad, but because one combo in particular with monk is so good that it really pushes everything out. I talked about this a little bit in the monk and fighter builds already, but monk builds are very heavily constrained, and the vast majority of them are going to be an 8-4 or 9-3 split with Rogue, because Thief Rogue combines so phenomenally well with Monk that it just kind of pushes all the other options out of uh, availability. Monk also is a class that doesn't want to multiclass just by its nature, usually, because it gets a lot of abilities later on down the line, somewhat backloaded, and because a lot of the things it does don't really interact with things that other characters are doing. Uh, Monk in in 5th edition's design is in some ways playing a different game than the other characters. You don't usually use the same items, you don't care about armor, you have uh, just like different requirements than a lot of other classes, and so that means that unless the Monk levels support the core gameplay of another class in some way, like the offhand attacks for a fighter, or the other class supports the core gameplay of Monk in some way, the two won't mesh because they're often just pulling in different directions and trying to do different things. However, there's still a bunch of cool Monk multi-classes that are worth checking out not that aren't just the Thief Rogue multi-class, so let's continue to talk about them. We'll start with Monk and Paladin. And honestly, these two classes really don't have a lot to offer one another. Monks will typically not want the heavy armor and shield proficiencies from Paladin. Paladins don't really want anything that Monk gives you, because in order to make use of the um, Monk's stunning strike or unarmed attacks, you need to not be making weapon attacks, and you can't smite when you're making unarmed attacks. So Paladin's core class feature of smite attacks and Monk's core class feature of unarmed attacks don't play well together. Paladins also really want to be in heavy armor, Monks want to be in no armor, so the two classes really pull in opposite opposite directions. E even um, splashing in one level of paladin to a monk to do like the armored monk thing just does not work as well as doing that with cleric or fighter, either of which provide you armor and shield proficiency and weapon proficiencies much more easily than paladin does and with way more uh, Way, way more powerful items and options, or not items, way more powerful features and options than, than one level of Paladin, because Paladin really needs to hit level 2 to get its good features online, and those involve spell slots, which Monk doesn't get. The one option that does work is 
if you're a dexterity-based paladin, you can take one level of monk, similar to a dexterity-based fighter, and get an offhand attack with your monk, uh, an offhand unarmed strike uh, with a monk. However, that is significantly weaker for paladin than it is for fighter as an option, just because paladins can't make smite attacks with the offhand attack, so it just won't be doing as much damage. Paladins are making fewer attacks in general than fighters, because they have fewer ways to boost their attacks and don't get the third attack at 11. So even splits between these characters don't work out very well. Uh, paladin levels don't really offer anything to monk levels, but... One level of monk is a fun way to add a little bit of extra damage to a paladin, and so that could be a potential niche build. I think that overall, the the fact that there are basically no evenly split builds, there's only a splash in one direction, and that's like not a very good splash, puts this in the niche category. These two classes are just really pulling in opposite directions and do not mesh very well together. Monk and Ranger. So these seem like they're going to have a little more synergy for martial characters, because Ranger, of course, wants to have at least medium wisdom in order to cast its spells sometimes, uh, especially if you're using spells with safety seas, and you can benefit from the extra Gloomstalker attack at the beginning of combat. Hor Hunter Ranger doesn't work, its abilities just don't work with unarmed strikes, so you would need to be a weapon monk in order to make use of Hunter Ranger levels, but Gloomstalker Ranger works pretty well, and actually helps fill some of the holes that monks have in their builds by giving you extra initiative. If you are not using elixirs and therefore have to sacrifice some dexterity, uh, have to possibly sacrifice some dexterity to reach the 20 strength uh, alongside Tavern Brawler, then you might struggle with initiative. And initiative is very important for monks because they're squishy, so going second is really painful for them because they might die before they ever get a turn, and because their main uh, usage of the, the main usage of the character is to land stunning strikes, which, of course, if you do that before the enemy acts, then that's much, much better than giving them a turn. So the bonus initiative and additional attack from Gloomstalker Ranger is pretty useful for monks. It involves taking the 3-3 three, three split, uh, the 6-3-3 three, three split that we discussed with Fighter, in order to benefit from both Rogue and Gloomstalker Ranger, but that's definitely something that you can do, especially if you're an Elixir build. It is... Uh, because Ranger gets its subclass abilities at level 3, you can't do a 6-4-2 split the way you could with Fighter, so it's an even more constrained build than the than the Rogue Fighter Monk builds, um, but it is a viable build. Other level splits with Monk for Ranger really don't make very much sense. The offhand attack for Ranger is significantly worse for melee Rangers, who are p possibly being two-weapon fighters, uh, in which case the offhand unarmed strike doesn't um, doesn't benefit rangers at all if you're a two-weapon fighter. If you're a two-handed ranger, then you won't be able to benefit from it either because you will um, you will not have a monk weapon since two-handers don't count as monk weapons even if you're proficient with them. So you can't really make use of monks' um, martial arts attacks with ranger in any of the common setups, and a sword and shield ranger is not really a thing. It's possible you could do some sort of niche sword and shield ranger build, but I think that in general, you're stuck with just one uh, one way to build this, and that is with three levels of Gloomstalker Ranger added into a normal monk build with Rogue, and I think that that is probably worse than just doing the fighter build. I'm going to rate this a B-tier combination, because I think there are some interesting things that you can do with it, but it's quite constrained and just not as powerful as the other options, which is something that we're going to see a lot of the time with monk, because they have basically just one cookie-cutter build that's way better than all the others. Monk and Rogue. Yep, this is the one we've all been waiting for, of course, and I've already talked about it uh, several times over in the course of judging other builds with Monk, or any other multiclassing with Monk. You have to measure against Monk and Thief Rogue. Thief Rogue gives you an additional bonus action, which allows you to make an additional offhand attack, either with your martial arts offhand or a second flurry of blows if you're spending key points, which takes Monk's... Uh, number of attacks up to six in a round when you're doing an offhand attack without spending any resources other than key points for Flurry of Blows. This means that monks combined with Tavern Brawler and Breaking Bounded Accuracy are some of the highest damaging and most accurate classes in the game with massive numbers of attacks. You can get up to eight attacks if you're doing this alongside the open hand monk's additional bonus action, and obviously that's incredibly powerful um, even before adding in Bloodlust, Haste, and so on from allies or additional levels like Action Surge from a Fighter or the Gloomstalker Ranger extra attack that we've talked about.
It's worth mentioning, of course, uh, that Rogue and Monk actually benefit one another reasonably well, even outside even outside of this extremely broken pairing. Um, one level of Monk can work okay for a Rogue if you wanted to do some sort of shielded Rogue build with a with shield proficiency from another class. You could do your offhand Monk attacks, and that would actually be pretty reasonable for a Rogue. You can't sneak attack with unarmed strikes um, in Baldur's Gate, but you can at least get, gain a little bit of extra damage. Um, and Rogue offers not just the bonus action unarmed strike to... Uh, the extra bonus action to monks, it also offers the bonus action utility of dashing, hiding, and disengaging, which is incredibly relevant for monks. Monks do get their bonus action dashes and, and jumps, but uh, from Step of the Wind, but Rogue gets it without spending key points, and key points are a very constrained resource for monks, since you will tend to be spending lots and lots of them every combat. Even though they refresh on short rest, key points will often run out, so being able to save key points on your bonus action dashes and hides and stuff is really valuable. Being able to just dash twice in a turn, so you can enter combat, punch a guy a bunch, and then dash away, is also really nice for monks, because one of the things that monks suffer from is being relatively squishy, so if you leave them in a bad position, then they can die pretty easily, um, Whereas, but Rogue makes it very, very easy for you to enter combat, punch uh, the enemy that you wish to punch, and then leave combat all in the same turn, never putting your monk in danger. So even outside of the just broken base nature of these two classes combined with one another, which I should emphasize is incredibly broken. Um, they also just synergize really well in in terms of how the classes work together. Not just open-hand monks should pick up the Thief Rogue dip, every monk should probably take it, and I think it's a rare monk build that wouldn't be improved by going an 8-4 or 9-3 split with Rogue, S tier, of course. Monk and Sorcerer. So... I think there's basically only one way to build this combination, and that is a single level of Sorcerer to give your monk dialogue skills and the shield spell and the infinite out-of-combat flight that you get from Draconic, uh, get from Storm Sorcerer. Those things are all together pretty nice. The ability to position reasonably well uh, with the flight for your monk, and of course, you can cast a spell in combat and fly if you need to, although monks shouldn't need to because their bonus action jump should be just as good as the flight. Um, but the fact that the flight does use your movement speed is pretty powerful, because monks will gain a lot of additional movement speed, so this can be one of the ways to get some of the longest distance flights in the game, and that in, in and of itself is kind of cool. Um, and the shield spell is really good for monks, because Monks, like I've mentioned a few times, suffer from being a little bit squishy, and ad adding in the shield spell as a great defensive reaction can be pretty nice. I think that this actually is a better build than it looks like, even though Charisma is one of the only stats that monks don't need, um, so they're not typically going to want to be your party face. The things that Sorcerer gives you are not zero. Um, there's basically no reason to ever take a more even split of these characters. I just don't think that they synergize well at all. None of the things that these characters do are things that are wanted by the other two class, uh, by the other class. Um, and a level of monk doesn't do anything for sorcerer, so there's no no point in dipping monk on a sorcerer build because while you get unarmored defense on monk, you uh, while you get unarmored defense, you will not have high wisdom on your sorcerer, of course, because they are a charisma-based class, so you're not going to get additional unarmored defense, and sorcerer could do better by having mage armor or being a draconic sorcerer than you'll get from the monk unarmored defense. Overall, I think that that is just not a viable way to pair these two classes, but the one level of sorcerer dip for monk I think is actually pretty good, just because flight is not bad, but very, very hard to fit in. So it's very similar to the cleric dip in that it provides you something that you do actually want, but the way that monk level ups work are uh, quite constrained, and so I'm going to rate it similar to the cleric dip C tier. Monk and Warlock. Um... I'm struggling to think of a reason why you would want to pair these two classes together. Uh, Warlock, Pact of the Blade, doesn't work with Monk's stuff because it you can't get charisma-based attacks on your Monk attacks, no matter how you uh, arrange it, so you will never be able to use the Monk's melee aspect stuff with your Warlock. 
charisma, again, is one of the very few stats that monk doesn't need, and so adding in charisma-based stuff to your monk makes them even more multi-attribute dependent than they are already, and adding in wisdom requirements to your warlock, while warlocks, of course, want okay wisdom, want some wisdom for saving throws, they are not going to have enough to benefit from unarmed, uh, from unarmored defense. Overall, these two classes just do not pair together at all, in my opinion. Um, you can get on Tactician or below, you can get a third attack through Monk's extra attack plus Warlock's uh, Pact of the Blade extra attack. And so that might be worth looking at on Tactician or below, but even then, that means that you are just taking a bunch of levels in a class that otherwise gives you nothing just to get extra attack in order to benefit your, your Warlock. Um, and so I just don't think that it's worth it. Warlock will pair, any martial Warlock would prefer to pair with any of the other martial classes in order to gain the extra extra attack, and Monk will prefer to pair with any of the other, any martial class rather than a spellcaster, and doesn't benefit at all from low level dips in Warlock. You get nothing at low levels of Warlock that you want, uh, unlike Cleric or Sorcerer, so I think that this is our very first D-tier class combination where the two classes have almost literally nothing to offer one another. Monk and Wizard. So Wizard obviously gives you some of the same things that Sorcerer does, but without the out-of-combat flight from Storm Sorcerer and without the dialogue skills. Not that those are particularly good for Monks, but it is one option that you don't have with Wizard um, as a single level dip. As it's also very similar to Sorcerer in that I think single level dip of Wizard for your monk is the only real way to build this character. And I just don't think that it's worth it when the Sorcerer or Cleric dips exist. You would much rather have shield from your Sorcerer levels and then gain also the utility that you get from level 1 Sorcerer than have shield from a Wizard level and uh, just get less power level overall. There is maybe something you could do with some of the wizard subclasses. Abjuration Wizard pairs pretty well with all melee classes, so you could maybe do a six monk, six Abjuration Wizard build. I should probably play around with that a little bit more. Um, Divination Wizard splashes are never bad, like you can dip two levels of Divination Wizard just to get the um, portents, and those would be good. But in general, I think that you are just giving up way too much to take multiple wizard levels on your monk, because again, these classes are just completely pulling in opposite directions. Intelligence is, again, the one of the only stats that monk doesn't need a really high value in, and so adding in an intelligence requirement to actually use your wizard spells, if you wanted to, your spells to have save DCs, would be really bad. So you're stuck with utility spells, and the utility spells that you get from wizard are just much better better gotten from other classes if you're playing a monk uh, wizard hybrid, and so I'm going to rate this as our second D tier combination. Overall, I think that monk is really interesting because it multiclasses so well with the classes that it multiclasses well with, and so badly with a bunch of other classes. The reason for this is that monk is an extremely linear class. It has one strategy, and that's an extremely powerful strategy, but it has one strategy that it just wants to execute very well. So any levels that you take that don't add to that strategy just don't really do anything for Monk, because they are not a, a character that is interested in adding versatility into their portfolio. They're just interested in powering up their linear strategy extremely high. And that that is very fun, right? You can do tons and tons of damage with your monk because you can power that linear strategy up to uh, the moon. But it does mean that monk is less interested in trying to pull more versatile play patterns from other classes, which is one of the major uses for multiclassing in general in Dungeons & Dragons because it is so focused on executing its strategy. It also has some, some negative synergies just in general because it's looking for different items than other characters. Uh, usually monks aren't using weapons at all, so it doesn't need weapon or armor proficiencies and stuff. One of the main things that you get from multiclassing. So a lot of the time monk just isn't interested in what it's getting from other classes, and that's why you see it not pairing so well with the classes that aren't furthering the main goal of the character. Paladin multiclasses. So paladins want to multiclass basically for three reasons. Either you're using two levels of paladin for a spellcasting class in order to get smite attacks on that spellcasting class. That's the normal use case for, for example, bard and paladin multiclasses. Or you are using another spellcasting class to add 
uh, spell levels to your paladin build while um, in, in order to have higher level smite attacks. That's the typical use case for warlock multi-classes or sorcerer multi-classes for paladin. Finally, there's the possibility that you're using another martial class in order to try to mitigate paladin's multi-attribute dependency. Paladins are, uh, the, are an extremely powerful character, but the main downside of paladin is that they want a lot of levels. They need to be usually level 6 or level 7 before they get their best class features, and they are extremely multi-attribute dependent. Paladins require A strength-based paladin requires 5 of the 6 attributes to be at least at reasonable values, and usually at pretty high values for most of them, meaning that their attribute requirements are incredibly oppressive when you're trying to make paladin builds. Through multiclassing, you can try to mitigate those attribute requirements to uh, make your paladin sadder or single attribute dependent, and that will allow you to have your paladin function without having to chug elixirs every day if that's something that you're trying to avoid, or without having to eat a bunch of the stat item boosts for the your party, meaning that you will have them conflict less with your party for items. Paladins are a very greedy class, but by multiclassing you can reduce their greed somewhat. Overall, paladins are going to fit very well with a lot of other martial classes just because they're trying to do damage, and a lot of spellcasters because they need spell slots in order to do their high level smites. Let's jump in and start talking about Paladin multiclasses. We'll begin with Ranger. Paladin and Ranger at first actually seem like they aren't going to have a lot of synergy. Ranger is a half-caster, as is Paladin, so by mixing the two together you're not getting higher level spells than you would get by being monoclass. That means that uh, Ranger is never going to reach very high level spells if you just take a lot of levels of Ranger, so the smite attacks are not going to add to its damage significantly, and Ranger doesn't increase the level of spells that you get access to on your Paladin, so you're not increasing the damage uh, the the smite damage of your paladin massively. Ranger also wants to either stop at level 3 or stop at level 11 for most ranger builds, and paladin wants to hit level 6 or level 7, so those two number splits don't add up super well in most circumstances. Because these are both relatively backloaded classes, except for the uh, smite damage from paladins, which doesn't benefit a ranger multiclass that much, you will often struggle to fit these two classes together in a way that actually makes sense. However, there's one pretty solid exception that I think makes these characters work very well together, and that's using Gloomstalker Ranger in order to mitigate the downsides of your paladin. Gloomstalker Ranger gives you an extra attack at the beginning of combat, on the first turn of combat, and that extra attack, if you have smite set to a reaction, you can use smite attacks on. Um, um, as long as it's a melee weapon attack, and those smites will allow you to do even more damage in the initial round of combat. That's something that Paladin is very interested in, because it's a burst damage focused class. But more importantly, Gloomstalker gives you just plus three initiative for three levels in Ranger, which can allow you to lose uh, to have lower dexterity on your paladin. Paladins really want to win initiative, but often struggle to if you're a strength-based paladin because you just can't afford the dexterity that you need in order to have good initiative. Gloomstalker Ranger helps fix that problem while adding in an extra attack. Is that better than just playing a monoclass paladin and taking alert? Probably not always, but it is certainly a really powerful option, and the extra opening attack is very good for ranger for paladin builds because they it gives you a ton of additional damage. It also doesn't cost you any caster levels. You're not getting additional spell slots, but like an 8-4 paladin ranger gets all of the things that both classes want while uh, not losing any spell progression and getting the additional attack at the beginning of combat. That attack does an extra d8 of damage. That d8 will probably be multiplied because paladins are very likely to be trying to do critical hits frequently, so you can often critically force a critical hit plus a smite on that uh, opening attack and get a lot of extra damage. It's important, of course, to turn your smites to ask uh, onto your smites onto use on reaction in order to make that work, or you won't be able to use it with the Gloomstalker attack. Um, other than that, there aren't a lot of reasons to take these two classes together, but that build is quite good, and I think that that is actually a powerful enough use case that I'm going to place this in B tier. There's some other additional options, like uh, Horde Breaker from Hunter Ranger can be pretty interesting. The extra D8 from Colossus Slayer is probably worse most of the time than just 
continuing down paladin levels and getting the d8 on every attack that you get rather than just once per round um or getting action surge from a fighter for additional burst damage but there's some other synergies that you can get between these two classes um overall though mostly i think what you're doing is a 9-3 or 8-4 split with gloomstalker ranger and that's a pretty powerful build that has a lot of uh a lot of applications. I don't think it's necessarily that much better than a monoclass paladin, but it's it's definitely worth considering, and it solves one of the problems that paladin has by giving them a lot of uh, bonus initiative and an extra attack to maximize their burst. Paladin and rogue. So these two classes at first seem like they're not going to work together well at all because the image of them is so diametrically opposed. Rogues want to be sneaking around doing sneaky stabby stuff or shooting little crossbow darts from the shadows, and paladins want to be kicking in the door and bashing monsters on the head in a flood of radiant light. Not exactly compatible uh, playstyles. However, these two classes actually have a ton of synergy in some very interesting and surprising ways. First off, Assassin Rogue is amazing for paladins, because paladins love nothing more than critical hits. A critical hit with a smite attack doubles the damage that you're doing with a critical with the smite, and Assassin Rogue gets guaranteed critical hits against surprised enemies. That means that if you surprise an enemy and get an opening round of combat, you can make guaranteed criticals with all of your smites for that round um, if you have three levels of Assassin Rogue. Three levels of Rogue also fits in reasonably well with the normal uh, stopping points of seven or nine for paladins, and so you can end up with a pretty powerful build that is guaranteed to get critical hits while uh, doing massive smite damage uh, thanks to the assassin uh thanks to the high-level smites that you get and the assassin guaranteed crit feature. Advantage on those attacks is also pretty nice, just because paladins like advantage a lot. Hitting with your smite attacks is really important. You don't consume the smite on a miss, but it's still important because they do so much damage. Um, and so those two classes or subclasses pair extremely well together. You can also gain uh, quite a lot of benefit from Thief Rogue, because an offhand attacking paladin, well, paladin attacking with their offhand can still smite. So with Thief Rogue, you could make, theoretically, four smites in a single turn if you have a two-weapon fighting paladin, two with your main hand and two with your offhand. Um, and that is, of course, a massive amount of damage. In fact, probably the, the highest damage paladin build uses that setup combined with two Deva Maces in order to maximize paladin damage. Sorry, the... Uh, Deva, I think is how I, you say it, with a closer to a TH. Uh, I know some, some folks let me know in the comments, and I appreciate it. Um, but uh, overall, the amount of damage that that build dishes out is massive. Now, that's based on a bit of a dodgy rules exploit and is also quite gimmicky and late game, so it's not something that I'm going to take heavily into account. But just making two offhand attacks with your paladin to get additional smite attacks is very, very powerful with a two-weapon fighting paladin. You can also benefit pretty strongly from a couple Paladin levels in Rogue. Vengeance Paladin gets you the Oath of Vengeance, which when uh, self-cast gets you advantage on all your attacks, which lets you sneak attack on all of your attacks. Is it worth going three levels in Vengeance Paladin to get the, um, the Vow of Enmity? Uh, probably not, but just for advantage on all your attacks? Probably not, but that's definitely a powerful option. Another thing that Rogue and Paladin have that works well together is the cunning action dashes. Paladin can suffer sometimes from not having the ability to get to where it needs to be. Cunning action dash gives your Paladin a lot of extra mobility, which is very, very powerful, especially because Paladin often doesn't have great ways to use its bonus actions. A normal Paladin build just won't have a lot of bonus action uh, effects, and so the ability to add something that is relevant with your bonus action from rogue dashes is very powerful. Altogether, I think that these th these builds are not the normal way that you're going to build these two characters, but a lot better than they sound at first, and I'm going to rate the this class combination actually all the way up to A tier, because Assassin Rogue guaranteeing criticals is very, very powerful, and um, while it doesn't add caster levels to your paladin, so it's not going to be as high damage uh, per individual smite critical as other versions of the paladin. It guarantees those criticals, which is very good. And of course, there's a bunch of other ways that you can build it that are really nice. I don't think it quite cracks into S tier because paladin just really wants to be paired with a caster class or something that really boosts its uh, 
initial burst damage like fighter, but I think it's very close to S tier, so I, I wouldn't be upset if you wanted to bump that up a tier, but I think overall this combination is actually shockingly good. Paladin and Sorcerer. So this is a classic combination, the Sorcedin, uh, always said in that way and never in the other order. You'll hear like Palak or Lockedin for Paladin Warlock multi-classes, but for some reason people never say Palerer. Um, I can't imagine why. But this is a combination of that, just like all of the other Charisma classes, benefits extremely well from multi-classing with one another. Paladin benefits from just about everything that Sorcerer gives you. The additional uh, defensive options from Shield, the Flight from Storm Sorcerer, or Armor of Agathis from Draconic Sorcerer are both incredibly powerful. Uh, the ability to have higher level spell slots for your smites is extremely valuable, and of course metamagic works very well with your intention to burst things down. You can quicken a haste on yourself if you have um, three levels of Sorcerer and nine levels of Paladin, you can cast Quickened Haste on yourself, uh, or of course with a more even split you'll have more sorcery points to play with, and then go ahead and make your attacks for that round. All of those things work extremely well together. I think there are very few level splits between these two classes that won't make a functional build. The more Paladin, the more Sorcerer heavy builds will be a little gimmickier because you'll be less likely to actually land your attacks since you'll need to be have high dexterity and high charisma in order high dex or con high dex or strength and high charisma in order to use your spells and make weapon attacks for your smites um, but of course in Baldur's Gate 3 you have the option to use elixirs to gain a 20 in both of those stats and get extremely high level um spell DCs and extremely high level smite attacks, both in the same build with like a 10-2 split or something along those lines, and any build split of 5 paladin with any number of levels of sorcerer is going to be a pretty powerful build in terms of its smite attacks. Usually you're going to want to go with a 7-5 or 9-3 split between the two if that's something that you're doing because you can get the access to the higher level spell slots and everything that you get from paladin as well as your paladin auras, which are very important. But of course, both of these characters just do exactly what the other wants, and that is have smite attacks and have spell slots. You get heavy armor and shield proficiency while not losing too many caster levels or changing your save DCs because you're still a charisma-based class when you take a paladin level for sorcerer. So all of the above are incredibly valuable for one another. You also get a bunch of other small things like uh, friends and so on can be very valuable. The, the mixes of the different spells and cantrips between the two classes can be nice. Even very small amounts of healing from lay on hands can be useful for a sorcerer just for some more out of combat sustain. Um, this can be a very resource intensive build because you'll often be using meta magic so you'll be burning through sorcery points and lots of high level spell slots for smite so the one downside of this character combination is that it is very long rest dependent but well, that's just true of all paladins in general and this is just a more sustainable higher damage paladin um, for the most part and this is of course an s tier combination Paladin and Warlock. So this is, of course, another classic combination, and I think that this one has the distinction of being the two classes that, when combined with one another, have the most possible level splits while still being a top-tier character. I think as long as you have two levels of Paladin somewhere in the build, you can go with literally any level split between 11 levels of Paladin and uh, two levels of Paladin, so between 10 and... Uh, and between uh, 10 and 1 levels of Warlock, and you will end up with an incredibly powerful build with a reasonable argument to be made that this is the best possible build for this character. Even just one level of Warlock gets you Mortal Reminder, which is incredibly powerful, fearing all nearby enemies when you get a critical hit with your smite, which again, as a paladin, you're going to be trying to do, is very good. Um, but obviously the reason to take the, this build is to combine smite attacks and uh, charisma-based weapon attacks using Pact of the Blade. Pact of the Blade lets you set all your weapon attacks to charisma, which for a paladin is incredible, because it means that suddenly you get to have maxed out charisma instead of maxed out strength or dexterity, which gives you incredibly high saves with your paladin aura that you get at level 6, and lets you have your spells and attacks trigger off of the same stat, which is awesome for both uh, paladin and warlock, who want to be casting high-level control spells with 
high save DCs as much as possible. This makes it, alongside Paladin and Bard, one of the best possible combinations for the um, Ring of Arcane Acu for the Helm of Arcane Acuity, Ring of the Mystic Scoundrel, etc. Because you are doing everything with charisma, so you can always make an attack and then use the Ring of the Mystic Scoundrel to cast Command or something, and that is an incredibly powerful thing to be doing with your spell slots. Another thing that this class gets is that Paladins, normally an extremely long rest dependent class, because they need their spell slots for smite, can use Warlock spell slots to smite, and those recover on a short rest. So you'll always have your highest level smites available with a reasonable number of Warlock levels, and they come back on a short rest, turning this character from an extremely resourced uh, intensive character to one that can actually function throughout the day alongside more short rest dependent characters. It increases the sustainability of your paladin massively to be able to use warlock spell slots for smite. There's also just a ton of smaller synergies between the dialogue skills that they both have access to, armor and shield proficiencies and weapon proficiencies for warlock are incredibly powerful of course as well. Um, darkness is really good for paladins if you can do darkness and devil sight because it gives you advantage on all of your attacks, disadvantage on enemy attacks. Um, so all of those together are all just incredibly powerful options. I think basically, honestly, there's not that much for me to say about this combination because I think that you could build it almost at random and end up with an incredibly powerful character. Uh, that's something that I talked about a little bit when I was doing some of my build guides for this for this character or this these class combinations is that it's somewhat difficult actually to write a guide because it's so easy to come up with slight variations in level splits that give you um, basically the same amount of power. So any combination of levels between these two characters is going to be a super powerful character, obviously S tier. Now, it's also worth mentioning that on Tactician or below, uh, you are going to want to go with a 7-5 split almost certainly because that will between either seven levels of Paladin or seven levels of Warlock, depending on whether you value the auras more or value the smites more. But Getting five in both classes makes sure that you get your third attack from the stacking extra attack from Pact of the Blade. On Tactician or below, Pact of the Blade extra attack stacks with other sources of extra attacks, so your leveling's a little more constrained than it is on Honor Mode on lower levels if you want to optimize the character. But just because a better option's available doesn't mean those other class splits get worse, it's just that there's not that one stands out head and shoulders above them uh, on Tactician or below, but you can still just build with basically any level split between these two classes and end up with an incredible character s tier combination um and yeah nothing more to be said about that paladin and wizard so this is another build where wizard can play be a single level to give you access to all the wizard scrolls for caster levels that you have access to so combined with other caster levels or just more levels of wizard you can get up to like fourth level spells on a paladin while still reaching uh, normal paladin levels that's pretty good that can get you animate dead other day long buffs like that and other things it does mean that you're spending your spell slots on actually casting spells instead of smiting but the versatility that a level of wizard gives to your paladin is not to be ignored because any of the day-long buffs or utility spells that you get from wizard levels are very good. Some paladins don't normally get access to Misty Step, so wizard levels can help you with that. Um, and that is just a bunch of additional options for your paladin. You could also go in reverse, um, similarly to how you could with any other caster, and take a couple levels of paladin to have smite attacks on your wizard. Typically speaking, you're not going to want your wizard to be in melee, but there's a couple exceptions to that. Most notably, abjuration wizards are just fine in melee, and I bet there's actually a cool build, although I haven't tried this one myself, that you could do with um, smite attacks combined with a retaliation wizard build. That's definitely something for me to keep in mind. I might do a build guide on that if it ends up working out pretty well. Uh, with abjuration wizard levels, armor of agathis from sorcerer levels, and smite attacks from paladin, it would be pretty multi-attribute dependent or require elixirs in order to actually land your smite attacks, but I think that that build could be pretty cool. And overall, I think that just the addition of wizard spells to your paladin's arsenal thanks to learning them from scrolls means that this is probably a b-tier character combination there's some niche other builds that you could do with various smiting and so on but mostly i think you're doing this just to get uh wizard spells on your paladin and some of the utility spells that you can get on your paladin as a result are pretty useful there's nothing that is going to really wildly change how your paladin plays because most of the time you want to spend your 
spell slots on actually on smiting, not actually casting spells. Um, but wizard gives you a few things. Also, divination wizard can be used to guarantee critical hits if you roll a 20 on your portent. And uh, I guess you can also collect camp supplies and long rest over and over again until you get a portent, a, a natural 20 on a portent. If there's a fight coming up, you really want to open with a critical hit. That sounds awful to me, uh, but you know, people have done sillier things in order to guarantee critical hits. So if that something that you enjoy doing, go for it. Um, and there's just a bunch of different options that you can add wizard levels to your, uh, add with one or two wizard levels to your paladin, maybe three for higher level spell slots, um, as well as the access to wizard spells that will make your paladin a little bit cleaner and more um, powerful. The one downside is that even if you get animate dead um, from wizard you don't buff it with the oathbreaker aura the animate dead zombies and skeletons do not gain benefit from oathbreaker if you could do that then it would probably be cooler uh because you could use skeleton summons alongside oathbreaker with the same build and there would be maybe a summon build but because the zombies don't have weapons and the skeletons are ranged they don't benefit from the oathbreaker aura even though it increases supposedly increases allied undead so there's some synergy that should be present that isn't present in Baldur's Gate 3 because of the specific implementation of those two class features uh, but overall this this combination works pretty well together. All right, I'm going to leave this up on the screen for a second so you can screenshot it. But overall, I think that Paladin is a really interesting class. Much like Monk, Paladin is a fairly linear class that mostly wants to boost the one thing that it does really well. But Paladin, unlike Monk, has a few alternate playstyles and also actually does benefit really heavily from adding in some versatility because it... it, it uh, benefits from things like mobility in a way that Monk doesn't, because Monk already has all the mobility. Paladin, of course, works extremely well with the other three Charisma classes. I think it would surprise me if any of these weren't um, com didn't combine extremely well with one another, because you can mix and match those two really easily, or those, those four really easily, and benefits a lot from additional action economy from some of the other classes, as well as bonuses from various... Uh, as well as more niche bonuses from various other martial classes and wizard levels. All right, my friends, this has been part three of the four-part series of the complete multi-classing tier list, covering every single combination of multi-classes in the game of two-class multi-classes and three-class multi-classes where appropriate. I hope that you've enjoyed the video, and of course, as always, if you have, then feel free to leave a comment uh, and like the video. I appreciate that very much because it helps me out with the algorithm, and I really like reading the comments. I read all the comments and reply to as many as I can. Um, and of course, you can subscribe to my channel for part four and the upcoming fourth part of this series where we go over the subclasses for multi-classing, as well as other strategy game guides and content. Cheers, folks. I'll catch you next time.